I'm a Bible scholar. When Moses came down the mountain, brought the Ten Commandments, there was thunder and lightning. There was the sound of a trumpet. And there was smoke coming out of the mountain. The people were afraid. They trembled. And they kept at a distance. Then they said to Moses, you know what? You better speak to us, not God. And when Jesus walked down the mountain where he had just delivered what we call the Sermon on the Mount, his audience was astonished. They talked to each other and said, this is a wonderful teacher. And then another one said, you know, he speaks with authority. And the third person added, yes, not like our Bible scholars. (laughs) Now, I'm a Bible scholar. What do you know if you find out that you're the bad guy in the Bible? Believe me, when I finish class, there's no thunder and lightning. There's no smoke coming out of anything. And you know why? Because I'm not teaching with authority. I just teach like one of those Bible scholars. Let me explain to you why the Christian community has a strange relationship to scholarship of the Bible. In our story, Jesus comes to the town where uh, where Lazarus lives with his two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they uh, feed him very well. And then Mary comes in and she spends all this money, takes this very expensive perfume, anoints his feet, And then Judas Iscariot comes. And he presents a perfectly perfectly reasonable argument. Shouldn't we take all this money? 300 denarii um, are about a year's wages. You know, in the, the story of the vineyard, where they have to negotiate the day's wages, it's one denarius. So from that, we can see this is, you know, salary for a whole year. He spends it in a few minutes. Well, of course, it started to smell really good. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't it have been better to just give it to the poor? But be careful. The Bible tells you that Judas is a bad guy. Remember what he says? He says uh, um, he doesn't really care about the poor. He was a thief. He was the one who was going to betray Jesus very soon. So be aware, as you read the Bible, don't take any sympathies with good arguments. Hmm? Well, scholars are not bound by that rule. Scholars can go with good arguments. And this is why they don't teach with authority, because they can see another perspective that may contradict the text. One of the works that we do as scholars, is that we produce translations that are used in the Christian community to read the Christian Bible. And if you still have one in your pews, we just, we're using them. Uh, You will find that the translation that we're using here in this church is called the New Revised Standard Version. It is a scholarly uh, product of people sitting together for years, looking at the Greek and the Hebrew text and trying to find out what a very fair and good translation is. Um, The only problem with it is that they obviously let them design the title as well. New Revised Standard Version. These are really four disclaimers. New, does that mean that there already was uh, something like a Revised Standard Version? Yes, that's what it means. Revised. Does it mean that the Bible of our fathers and mothers had mistakes? Sure. Sure. Standard. Does that mean that there are other translations around as well? Why a standard cannot really exist if there isn't some variety? That's exactly what it means. Version? Oh, you you mean you paid all those smart folks for several years? just to produce a version and not the original? 
exactly where your money went. <laughs> you got it. Or do you want to know what I think, really think, about the story of John that we just heard? <clears throat> the Gospel of John, in its last chapter, in chapter 21, has the voice of the editors of this Gospel. They write to us, they speak to us, and they tell us a few things. One of the things they tell us, they speak in their own voice, as we, is that they based this gospel on an old manuscript that they had found that, that was written by the beloved disciple, who is mentioned in the text several times. They also tell us that they believe that the witness of this disciple is trustworthy. Now, you, when you hear that, someone endorsing something as trustworthy, they already tell you that there are other people there who see it quite differently. You know, you don't need to endorse a witness if everyone has the same opinion. Yeah, you with me? Yeah, that's what scholars do. They also tell us that they put the book together after the beloved disciple had died. So it's referred to in the last chapter that, you know, there's this discussion between Peter and the beloved disciple. And uh, Jesus says, you know, if I wanted to, that this disciple would, would live until I come back. You know, Peter, what do you worry about that? Well, that sentence only makes sense if he had died because the editors then kick in and say, listen it again. Listen carefully. They make a footnote and say, Jesus did not say that he would still be alive. All that Jesus said is that if he wanted to, he would still be alive. Obviously, he didn't want to. Now, what they don't tell us is how long this person was dead. Two weeks, two years, 20 years, 50 years. There's nothing in the text. For us, it would make a difference. It is also clear that in this witness of the gospel, the witness of this beloved disciple that they're quoting, by the way, when I said, you know, Judas was not really interested in the poor, and you look it up in your NRSV and any other modern edition, it's, in, it's in, in parentheses. The editors, instead of changing the text of the beloved disciple, added footnotes. Hmm? They wanted to make absolutely sure that you and I don't think that Judas was a good guy, because the argument is not all that bad. And there are people like those people who wrote Jesus Christ Superstar who felt that Judas really had something to say. Or the people who wrote the Gospel of Judas in the second century saw it through his perspective. You could have sympathies with them, even within a Christian culture and environment, but you're not supposed to have that. So the editors of the Beloved Disciples manuscript put in, once you look, read to John, you'll see brackets all over, and then you see, Rabbi, bracket, this is teacher. Mm -hmm. So you, you see that, and this is translated as this and this. There's always brackets in our thing. It's, it's quite interesting. By this, they give their source, the manuscript, a higher authority. We didn't change it. This is really what he wrote. We just give you our commentary, like we did at the end. And then there are other passages that are not stories, but they are speeches. You know, Jesus talks with Nicodemus, um, goes back and forth, and all of a sudden, Jesus takes off and has this, you wonder, what did he smoke? He has this wonderful, apocalyptic, about, it's revelatory, and he says, I only repeat what God is telling me. Yeah, he's channeling. He's channeling. This is a text that we find in the Old Testament with some prophets. They say, this is the word of God, and they give literally what God had told them. This is how ancient oracles work. If you have a problem, you go to Delphi, you pay the priest to get an answer, or, or uh, the many, of, many other locations as well. Didymos in, in Asia Minor is another big oracle. Um, or the book of Revelation is like that. Yeah. John is there on Patmos, perfectly busy writing his book, and all of a sudden something happens. Yeah? And then he records whatever he sees and whatever he says. The Book of Mormon is written the same way. But why would they publish a book like that, and why would they say that the witness is true? Because they're criticizing the Gospel of Luke. If we take this story about the anointing, you know, the woman that comes in with the long hair, the Gospel of Luke tells exactly the same story, but not during the Passion Week, but early on in the, in the, in the ministry of Jesus in Galilee. And there it is just a woman with very long hair and very rich. 
and it's in the house of a, of a rabbi, and the rabbi is, is completely disgusted that Jesus doesn't know what kind of a profession this lady has, you know, and he's supposed to be the Messiah? Well, obviously, the other man knew what profession it was. Huh? She had, and we don't. Huh? All of that has created in the history of interpretation the idea that this woman must be a prostitute. And of course, if you have long hair and a lot of money to spend on perfume, you must be a prostitute. Mm -hmm. Let's just not tell the, the mall here, about there, thing that this is what everyone knows. This is the part. Well, the Gospel of John says this is wrong. This was not a woman of, of ill repute. This is a woman of very, very high standing, the sister of Lazarus, the sister of Martha. This is a really, really good woman. It didn't happen early on in the ministry. It happened, remember the first line of our reading, six days before Passover, six days before Jesus died. Um, the cleansing of the temple. When did that happen? Well, of course, during Passion Week. Jesus does that on Monday, he dies on Friday. You go into the Gospel of, of, of John, you say, no, it's one of the first stories he tells. It's very early on in his ministry, and this is the reason why the authorities are after Jesus. Have you ever wondered why they were always trying to arrest him? Yeah, he gives a perfectly good example. He's correcting the Gospel of Luke. Only Luke has a story of the woman with the long hair and anointing. The date of Jesus' death, the other Gospels have that uh, Jesus died, he celebrated Passover meal and died the next day. But in the Gospel of John, he dies at the same time that the Passover lamb, lamb is sacrificed. So he could never have eaten it. And by dating the Passover, by dating the, the, the death of Jesus on a different day, this is the reason why to this very day we don't know when Jesus really died. Because the Passover is, is based on a moon calendar, and it could happen on every day of the week. So if you look for days where it happened on a Friday where they agree, where they celebrated Passover, we will have different years than if you look for a Friday following Passover. Yeah, you with me? And if you're not, it's all right. You're talking to a scholar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, do I think that the author of John has any reliable historical information about Jesus? No, not really. They're making up as they go along. They're making up stories of Jesus, and they're passing on their own revelation as something that John might have had, the beloved disciple. Can I be sure? No, I can't be sure. Why not? I'm not talking with authority, just like one of those biblical scholars. But these arguments are shared with many others, they are not stupid or dumb or you can't follow them. They are just simply what we do. As a scholar, you are trained to formulate your ideas in a way that it makes sense to others. Scholarship is about communicating. It's not about that it makes sense to me. It has to make sense to you. The methods we use to achieve this goal were developed by secular sciences. And our audience is not limited to the Christian community alone. We have to submit our, idea, our ideas in a form which meets secular standards of scholarship and science. Scholarship is not about telling everyone what is right and what is wrong. Scholarship is about encouraging each other not to act on whatever is said to you with authority, but to be critical, to go back to the sources, to check them, to make up your own mind. Scholarship is not about repeating what others have said before us. Scholarship is about finding your own voice. It is also ecumenical and interfaith. Um, I'm a specialist in manuscripts. I work with handwritten originals of the Bible text. And when I went to Patmos, which is the third largest deposit of Greek manuscripts in Greece, they wouldn't treat me very nicely because as a Lutheran, yeah, which is my, I'm, from their perspective, I'm of a rather late Christian sect, yeah, very far away. It's like Jehovah's Witnesses knocking at your door or something like that. They don't want to let you into. But once you establish trust, we don't talk about our religious differences. I've worked in the Vatican. Lutherans used to kill Catholics, and Catholics used to return the favor. 
But when it comes to manuscripts and I talk to the librarian in the Vatican, we're like from the same church. It's just combining. I've worked in Iran in, in, a, in, a big, in a big library with Muslim colleagues. And that was during, you know, when we had really tough problems with our own government and they had their own problems with their government. Uh, none of that was important. We were like family. This, uh, a few years ago, I worked in Timbuktu at the library that was destroyed a few weeks ago by the, by the soldiers as they moved out. Um, it doesn't matter. I don't even know what his religion was. It doesn't matter. Scholarship can cross all those borders that churches actually want to cross and have such a hard time. But I think I made my point. And I don't want you to feel sorry for me. It's really nothing. The Bible is full of bad guys, and there's a good chance that you're one of them. I mean, just imagine if you're a tax collector, huh? work for the IRS, or do you have to do taxes for other people, or, or whatever you do, you work for the system. Nah, they don't like you very much. Mm -mm. Tax collectors and sinners and drunkards are usually in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. If you're a lawyer and you can't part with the money that you made being a lawyer, good luck with the New Testament. The lawyer came and said, you know, tell me what I have to do. And Jesus gave him all the rules. And, and he said, well, I kept them all. And then Jesus said, well, then just go and give away all your money. And he turned around and was very sad. He couldn't do that. A lawyer? Nah, not the best people. Woman? Poor. Very. Especially if you have long hair and smell good. If you think that slavery is not such a great institution, you better not read the Bible. Slavery is OK, perfectly. Just treat them well. Hmm? Yeah, sounds like employer. Pay them, you know, don't pay them a lot. Just, just enough that they can survive. That's OK. If you don't agree with that, you better, you're the bad guy in the Bible. Or if for some really weird and strange reason, you think democracy is a good way to rule each other, ah, the Bible is against you. We sh we're supposed to be for, pray for the king and the emperor, and this is better this way. If you're a donor, but you always want a receipt so you can deduct it from your taxes, have you never heard that the left hand should know what the right hand does? You're not a good guy in the Bible. Or if you're a lesbian, or gay, or transgendered, good luck with that. But as I said, don't feel sorry for me. I was born a heterosexual, white, Protestant male. When I took my first breath 55 years ago, I had everything going for me. And I cannot imagine what it means to be black and to be stopped in an inner city in the middle of the night, just in the car. I can't imagine what this is like. Or just being a woman. Many of the, those who studied with me are now pastors, but you know, for the man, this was a home game, home run. But the women had to fight to be ordained. And I started to study in Germany and Bavaria, women, were, it wasn't clear yet. And for, for strange reasons, the church was afraid if they would ordain a woman who was pregnant at that time, that they, at the same time they would pass on the apostolic blessing on the little baby, on the fetus. And they can't do that because that fetus didn't go through three years of seminary and it didn't pass all those. You know, it's just, it's weird, but it's, you, we've been through that. For us, it now sounds like history and there are only very, very few denominations that, haven't, that are not doing it. But at the time, it was fought over and just because you were a woman. The call that you received from God to go into ordained ministry wasn't worth anything. We have plenty of women. You don't get paid the same amount of money here for the same job. That no, doesn't seem right. Or if I were born a Catholic, I mean, look at our media. Everywhere you go, this is a Protestant country in their background. Or so, well, Catholic priests, they're all, you know, we all, they have their things going on with boys, and it's always out there. You know, I've been in this business as a seminary professor for almost 30 years, and so I had a student, a student in her first parish, and the Methodist pastor next door came over, broke into her house, raped her at gunpoint. And do you think this is going to be the big news in the media? No, it's not. And it's just simply a part, if you put pastors together with, with teenage girls, that you will have certain things during confirmation going on that we know about and every church knows about it, but it never makes the big news. 
As soon as something happens in the Catholic Church, it's all out there. And why? Because they decided to be Catholics. Nah, you're born Catholic or you're born Protestant. There are really only a few people that go back and forth. So don't have any, don't feel sorry for me. I really had, really had everything. And you know, I've always taught, when I was taught at Yale, a third of the faculty was gay. When I taught Bangor Theological, the same, oh, here in, in, in Springfield, you have a sizable portion as well. But when I talked to Bangor Theological Seminary, I think it felt that we were the only couple. Or maybe there was one other couple that was somehow normal. No? And the, um, but what they have to go through to just make clear that they do this as a Christian, that they have a spiritual life, they have to talk about sex all the time. Yeah? This is the topic that everyone wants to know about. If they talk about gay issues, everything else is unimportant. No one has asked Vera and me, you know, what we like especially, or uh, please would you divulge that in front of a congregation and tell us why this is important and write three big books about it? No one. This is embarrassing. This is terrible. And why do I not have to speak about it? Because I was born a heterosexual. It's the reading from John got at least one thing right. Just having long hair does not make a woman a prostitute. Mm -hmm. Being a Bible scholar does not mean that you cannot be a devout Christian. The Apostle Paul feels called to work with the Gentiles, and Gentiles is a $10 word for the others, those who don't fit into the establishment of the Judean movement. Those were the ones he felt called to work with. We are all the others for someone in some respect. And the best thing we can do about it is just be ourself and talk, speak about it. Don't let people get away saying things that are not OK. And the next time, they will think about it. Um, our tradition is that where two or three are gathered in a Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be among them. There was no requirement about gender or sexual preference or skin color or any of that. It's just where two or three are gathered in my name. And everyone who belongs to the others better do that and claim their spot in the Christian community. It is my really strong belief over the years watching the homophobic tendencies in, 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 in American culture. When we came over, it was quite a shock for us. We thought this was Europe 30 years ago. Um, but the only thing that really helps is not talking about it, not writing the great books, not being having sitcoms about it or something. It's simply about meeting someone and simply them not hiding it and not even make it a topic. This is not necessary. Remember when my mom came home after she had her hair cut once here in Springfield and the hairdresser was obviously talking about his boyfriend and how, how, she, how, how, how nervous he was because for the first time the parents of his boyfriend were going to come and visit their home and, and they had cleaned it all up and they tried to do and they thought for, for weeks about the menu that they were going to serve. My mom came back and said, that's like with a real couple. I said, yes, they are a real couple. <laughs> um, and these things need to happen. So. Everyone is invited to the table. The others need us as much as we need them. So what do you do when you find out that you're the bad guy in the Bible? Be yourself. Be who you are. And please don't shut up. Amen. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.